Epipology Network uh, seminar. Uh, the speaker today is Wojciech uh, Czacholski. Uh, I'm not sure I got this right. And he will tell us about TDA invari uh, invariance and model categories. All right, uh, yeah, Wojciech Czacholski. Uh, it's, uh, I'm very honored to be speaking at this venue. You know, I've been a long time fan of this algebraic, uh, applied algebraic topology network. Okay, uh, and this is, I just want to point out that this is the first of two talks uh, and the second uh, one will be delivered by Barbara Junti during the next seminar, uh, I believe, uh, and it will be much more concrete. During this talk, uh, I will give you an overview of our work, okay? Uh, do you, so I shared a, uh, a screen of an app, uh, a window of an app. Can you see it? Can you, can everyone see it? Well, Yes, we can. Okay. Uh, so, uh, as Sarah said, please interrupt me, ask any question, uh, uh, you know, during my presentation. Okay. All right. So here we go. So, uh, you know, during the last several decades, uh, a lot of work and effort has been made to explain and capture meaning of homotopy and meaning of homotopy phenomena. So probably nowadays, uh, the most uh, popular framework in which to express uh, homotopy phenomena are infinity categories. But today, uh, however, I will talk about more classical framework uh, for doing homotopy theory, uh, framework of model categories. Um, uh, so, uh, you know, I like model categories because of their simplicity. That's one of the aspects. And model categories are based on few rather simple axioms that I will present later on during the talk, although you do not need to comprehend them. Uh, this is just so you see uh, uh, how these axioms look like, but a few rather simple axioms. And uh, that part I like. What I, you know, the simplicity, however, is also its disadvantage because it is so simple, there are limits to phenomena that can be captured. By model categories. Okay. So, uh, in a nutshell, all these frameworks for doing homotopy theory, all these approaches, uh, in a nutshell, is about being able to form spaces of morphisms, spaces of maps, spaces of functions, as opposed to sets of morphisms. Okay. So, if you have such a space of morphisms, a homotopy is simply a path in such a space. So, if you have two such homotopies, one can wonder if these homotopies are homotopic themselves, or if you, if you, if they are homotopic, whether the homotopies that homotope them are homotopic themselves, etc. And capturing all this information becomes very quickly unmanageable. Okay. So uh, these frameworks for homotopy theory allows to talk about homotopy phenomena without being forced to construct explicit homotopies. They, for example, give existence of certain maps that imply existence of certain homotopies. And the slogan I uh, would use here is, cap, you know, this is about capturing homotopy phenomena without constructing homotopies, which is typically very hard. You know, homotopy theorists is try to escape constructing explicit homotopies, okay? Uh, I would also like to uh, point out that the goal of homotopy theory is to simplify. Uh, you know, so the hope is that up to uh, homotopy relation, you know, homotopy relation determined by a choice of this space structure on morphisms, up to this homotopy relation, objects of our investigation will become simpler. You know, the homotopical properties become more manageable, maybe understandable and describable. Okay. And of course, this often depends on the choice of these mapping spaces. So in choosing an adequate mapping space, the key technique in homotopy theory is to simplify by focusing only on part of the information. For example, you know, instead of considering an entire topological space, we might look at its n-connected cover. Okay, and that's the, you know, and you know, and depending on which mapping space we choose, you know, we instead of you know talking about uh, this homotopy relation would force us. Uh, would imply that we only focus on on the n connected cover of the of the considered spaces. So simplifying homotopy theory helps us simplify. And uh, note 
the data analysis is also about simplifying and extracting summaries that are computable and manageable. Okay. So uh, one wonder, besides these common strategies of simplifying, what do model categories and homotopy frameworks have to do with data analysis? All right, I just, uh, what? So, uh, so this talk is based on our work with Barbara Junti and Claudia Landi and has two primary goals, okay? Uh, first is to il illustrate why model categories provide a convenient, in our mind, framework in which to define and study topological data analysis invariants, okay? And the second, second goal is to describe desirable requirements on this framework uh, for doing homotopy theory that might be useful for topological data analysis. So that's uh, that's uh, that's my uh, that's my goal. Illustrate why why this this abstract framework has anything. What this uh, abstract framework has you know has to do with with topological data analysis. Okay. Um, all right. So to explain the connection between model categories and topological data analysis invariants, let us start with record with recalling the persistent pipeline. Okay, uh, let us start with recalling the persistent pipeline. So, uh, all right, so uh, for us, an input, so this is just to be a, uh, 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 you know, like a schema of this pipeline. So an input is a distance, it's a finite set together with a distance uh, on, uh, on this set, okay? Uh, possibly a metric, but may not necessarily satisfy the triangular inequality, okay? So it could be like cosine distance, okay? So we, so in persistent pipeline, what we do, we translate this distance information into, uh, into spatial information, into hierarchy of simplicial complex, complexes, for example, via the vietorius rips construction. Okay, in this step, just so we are aware, this step doesn't, lose or add any information. It's like unzipping, you know, distance space is very, very uh, uh, economical way of, uh, of uh, encoding certain structure. And this Vietoris rips is like unzipping this big file in this spongy, huge object. Okay? We do that. So why, why, why do we do that? We do that uh, in order to be able to apply homology to obtain so-called persistent module. We take homology of each of these Vietorius Rips complex and obtain a vector space. Okay. So what what uh, what have we achieved by transforming a distance, an input, into a persistent module? Okay. What we have achieved is simplicity. Okay. Why 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 is it why this uh, why we achieve simplicity? Because there is a decomposition theorem that states that that states that all in decomposable persistent modules are bars, okay? And there's this bar decomposition of these persistent modules. Every, you know, uh, every, every persistent module can be identified, can be enumerated by a sequence of pairs of real numbers, okay? That satisfy certain very, you know, inequalities, okay? Uh, but let us look, however, at the following two examples of distance spaces consisting of nine points, okay? And the distance is, is, is defined so that the disks, that, that the squares are the disks in, uh, in, uh, in, in, in these distance spaces, okay? Then uh, for, these, for these two distance spaces, persistent H0 and H1 homology modules for both of these distance spaces, they coincide, okay? So, uh, you know, uh, so one might ask, you know, so maybe, maybe, you know, this this persistent pipeline in this case is is maybe oversimplifying. Okay, we achieve our simplifying goal, but possibly we oversimplify. Okay, so one might ask, could we be more discriminatory, and still computationally reasonable? 
Okay, one of the thing of this of this simplicity of bar decomposition is that it's computable. Okay, now we have you know great software like Ripser to do that. So uh, what we do, we uh, propose a change to, of this pipeline and not to go all the way to the homology modules, but to stop a step earlier at the chain complex level, okay? So here's the slogan, persistent homology oversimplifies and forgets too much. So let's not, not to go all the way to homology, by stop, by, uh, but stop a step earlier, okay? So uh, now here's a, our modified, uh, modified, uh, uh, persistent pipeline. Okay. Uh, so uh, as before, uh, we start with a distance space that we, you know, encode by spatial information through, for example, the Torres Rips construction. Okay. But now, instead of taking homologies at each time, we take the chain complexes at each time with coefficients in a given field. And now to obtain not a persistent module, so parameterize vector spaces by, by uh, non-negative reals, but in this case, we get a parameterized chain complexes by non-negative reals, okay? Uh, so, uh, uh, so for, non, for every non-negative real, we have a chain complex, okay, which in degree n uh, is, uh, is the vector space generated by simplices of dimension n. And these chain complexes, this is a parameterized chain comp, are, are, you know, are connected via transition functions, okay? So for T0 less than T1, we have this map that satisfies these associativity, uh, uh, associativity uh, uh, conditions, okay? Now, these, uh, these transition functions are not arbitrary, you know, because X is finite, there is a, uh, these transitions are tame, okay? So now I want to explain this uh, term tame. Because X is finite, there's a sequence of uh, finite number, finite sequence, such that uh, this transition function may fail to be an isomorphism only when going from S to T, we have to jump over one of those uh, elements uh, in my chosen sequence, okay? Uh, if I have such a sequence and we say that the sequence discretizes my parameterized chain complex. Okay, so uh, uh, tame, something is tame if it has such a discretizing sequence. Okay, so uh, original persistent simplification translates input, whatever it is, into uh, tame parameterized vector spaces, okay? And the simplification is achieved since parameterized vector spaces, you know, since, well, they can be, they, they have a bar decomposition, you know, in decomposable parameterized vector spaces can be enumerated by pairs of real numbers, okay? Uh, now, modify persistence takes input, whatever it is, and converts it into parameter, tame, parameterized chain complex, okay? So I already gave you an example of this modified persistence using Vietoris Rips construction, but there are several other ways of, uh, of retrieving uh, or assigning parameterized chain complexes to various objects. And Barbara uh, will mention explicitly some of uh, those other ways uh, of obtaining such parameterized chain complex during the next seminar. So one might ask, what do we gain by converting things into parameterized chain complexes? Okay. Why, why, why do we think it's simpler? Well, it is not simpler in a way that these tame parameterized vector spaces are simple because tame parameterized chain complexes are of wild representation type. There's no way we can enumerate it's in the composables. Okay. All right, uh, so why we can think about this process, you know, of converting things into param into tame parameterized chain complexes as a simplification, okay? Uh, so to explain that, we are going to use the language of model categories, 
Okay, and here's 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 this this message that I would like to say is that that simplification occasionally can be achieved not by decompositions or representation type, but also using model categories. Okay. Uh, okay. So since this lecture is about model categories, I thought I need at least to present its definition. Okay. I need at least present its definition. Uh, so, uh, so here it is. Okay. Uh, and again, I would like to point out that you don't need to, for those who never seen this, you don't need to, you know, comprehend this. I would like you to just see, uh, you know, basic ingredients. Okay. We are not going to effectively use it. Uh, of course, if you want to read some proofs and technical solutions, uh, you know, comprehension is needed, but to understand the, the, the flow, uh, uh, of reasoning, it's not, but at least I will state it once. So a model structure is a choice of three collection of morphisms called some, some morphisms you'll call weak equivalences. And that's the sign I will use it. It's an arrow with a little uh, twiddle on top of it. A cofibration, which, which is, uh, which looks like an inclusion and a fibration that looks like a bundle. Okay. Now, uh, not arbitrary three choices, uh, give you a model structure. Uh, these choices have to satisfy the following conditions. First, First, that all finite limits uh, and and uh, collimates should exist. What this means, it means that you will you should be able to perform pushouts, pullbacks, finite products, and coproducts. Okay. Now the second condition says if you have two composable maps F and G, and if two out of those three are weak equivalences, so either if if F and uh, F G are weak equivalences, then so is the third, and so is G. Okay, that's uh, the second axiom. The third axiom guarantees that all these weak equivalences, all those three collections are closed under retracts. If one map is a retract of another and, uh, and this other is a weak equivalence, then so is the, uh, the first one. Okay. Uh, the fourth axiom assure existence of certain map. And we can use that to construct certain homotopies. So it uh, assures the existence of certain maps under uh, Two scenarios. Uh, so the left map has to be cofibration, the right map has to be fibration, and such a this dotted lift exists if either this cofibration from X to Y is a weak equivalence, or the right map, the right fibration is a weak equivalence. Under those two uh, scenarios, this lift has to exist. Okay. So you see, we we uh, uh, translate looking for homotopies by assuring that certain maps exist. Okay. Uh, now the last axiom says that any any map, any morphism can be factored in two ways: first, cofibration, which is a weak equivalence, and then fibration, or cofibration and then a fibration, which is a weak equivalence. All right, so th these are the axioms, okay? Uh, so, you know, you, you know well, these are the axioms. And here is, uh, there's no, no need for comprehension of, the, of, of, of details of these axioms, but here's an example. I will give you an example, uh, our key example of a, of a model structure. So the following is a model structure on non-negative chain complexes over a field, okay? So I have to tell you what, I have to give you uh, three classes of maps. And then I will, I will, I will not prove it. But then, you know, it's it's a theorem that these three classes of maps satisfies those five axioms. So a map between chain complexes is a weak equivalence if it's homology isomorphism. Okay. A map is a cofibration if it's an inclusion in every degree. Okay. And a map is a fibration if it is surjection, not in every degree, but in all positive degrees. I don't insist that it's surjective in the zero uh, degree, but I insist that it's surjective from degree one and on. Okay. Uh, all right. So uh, yeah, the theorem and states that all these three maps, all these three collection of uh, maps satisfies the requirements, you know, uh, of the axioms, satisfies the axioms. Now, if you have a model structure, here's a way to modify to get a new one, okay? 
question. So uh, let's be a model category, okay? Like for example, the chain like, complexes, non-negative chain complexes. Really quick, so Wojciech, I think there's a question. Question, all right. Question, okay. All right, sorry. All right. Um, your definition of vibration and co-vibration, I don't see any sort of lifting properties going in this. Is the, how, where are you getting your lifting into sort of a total space and a base space out of this, those three principles? Right, so, right, so, uh, so, uh, right, so, uh, well, you have to prove the theorem that these definitions of vibration, co-vibrations, you know, satisfies these axioms, which, and one of those axioms is this lifting, this MC4 is this lifting. Okay. Right, that's Thank the you. lifting axiom. And, okay. uh, uh, but it's, a, well, it's an axiom, okay? And you have to, you know, prove that those three, those, there's these, these maps that satisfies these properties, satisfies this lifting axiom, okay? Okay, That's a, that's a theorem, right? Okay, thanks. It doesn't come for free, okay? It uh, doesn't come for free, uh, it's, uh, you have to prove it. Okay, it's not too complicated if you assume, uh, if you assume uh, your, uh, your uh, coefficients are a field, the same actually is true if you assume over any ring, for those people who care, uh, and that's a little, little more involved, but, but in general it's not. Okay, okay. thanks. Uh, all right, okay, so, so we have an example, a very explicit example, and here's another, here's a, a way of constructing new model out of old ones. So we have an old model category. Now, we are going to look at pa tame parameterized objects in M. And I'm claiming that this has a model structure where weak equivalences and vibrations are these which are weak equivalences and vibrations at every time. Co-fibrations are a little bit more complicated. So a map is a co-fibration if the following morphisms are co-fibrations for all pairs. So I want that at time zero, it's a co-fibration. And you know, at time S and T, because, because this is a map from X to Y, we have these commuting square. Okay, those are transition functions for X. This is a transition function for Y. I hope you see my cursor, uh, and those are these these the uh, the maps induced by f. So because of commutativity of this square, I have a map from a pushout into y at time t, and I want that map from that pushout to y t to be a cofibration. Okay. So again, there's a theorem that that these collections of weak equivalences, cofibrations and vibrations satisfy the axioms needed axioms okay so we can we can we can we can use this tame we can apply tame twice and what we will get we get tame now not par parameterized by a line but tame objects parameterized by a plane okay so we can sort of make it uh, they will uh, they will uh, propagate okay this model category will propagate all right so uh, so for example the following is a model structure. So I'm just applying those two. I'm applying the second statement to the first one, to the chain complexes, and I look at the tame parameterized chain complexes, and the following, the following morph, the following maps form uh, a model structure. A map is a weak equivalence if, if it's a homology isomorphism time, you know, for every parameter t. It is a vibration if it is surjection in positive degree for all t, and it's a co-fibration if it's injection at time zero, and if this map from, for every s and t, if this map from that push out into y t is also an injection between chain complexes. Okay. So, uh, right, okay. Uh, so this is, uh, yes, now I can't remember what comes the next. Okay, so yeah, so uh, so uh, here comes uh, here comes a question: Why the fact that uh, the above morphisms in these uh, parametrized chain complexes satisfies the five axioms of model category is relevant for TDA? Right? That's the information I just give you. Information that these particular maps satisfies these five axioms. Why is it relevant? Why do we bother? You know, in this seminar, for example. Okay, uh, why do we bother? Uh, so remember, 
This talk is to explain advantages of this modified persistence that takes values in ten parameterized chain complexes. So why having this model structure on the range, I mean, these maps satisfy these axioms, is advantageous. So this has to do with cofibrancy and minimality. So this is the next thing what I uh, uh, will, uh, will address, cofibrancy first. Okay. So do you remember objective, objective of data analysis to simplify, objective of our of our pipeline is to simplify. We want to extract information that's calculable and, you know, occasionally informative. If you retrieve too much information, then automatically will become, you know, uncomputable. But you want to sort of don't forget everything uh, or too much as homological, standard homological persistence. So objective is to simplify. So we can do that. We are going to do that. Uh, Using a cofibrant, uh, cofibrant, uh, uh, cofibrant, uh, uh, cofibrant object. Okay. So what is a cofibrant object? Those are these objects for which the map from zero to x, from the initial object or zero object to x, is a cofibration. Okay. So cofibrant. So this is this is sort of in homotopy theory. This is like a, a typical approach. You know. Or assumption, or or the truth, uh, is that often cofibrant objects tend to be more manageable. Okay, they tend to be more manageable and possibly describable. Okay, so for example, a tame parameterized chain complex is cofibrant if all its transition functions are inclusions. Okay, uh, so. That means that cofibrant chain parameterized chain complexes are the same as filtrations of chain complexes. This this lifting properties, this lifting properties uniquely characterize uniquely characterize filtrations. Okay. So now here is an example of a cofibrant object. You choose a natural number n, a number s between zero and a real number, non-negative real number, and a number that you know, which is bigger or equal than s, but might be infinity. Okay, so extended real number, but not big, not smaller than s, bigger or equal than s. Okay, then uh, the following parameterized chain complex. I use this symbol. I use that symbol. Uh, is cofibrant. Okay, so uh, on top here, I I tell you the time, the parameters. This is t for parameters t strictly less than s. The second. Uh, um, uh, the second table is uh, for parameters bigger or equal than s, but strictly less than e. S stands for start, e stands for end, and the last is the for parameters bigger or equal than the end. So for parameters less than a start, you get zero. So this is a parameterized chain complex. You start with zero till you hit s, and at time s, you put a sphere. So this is a chain complex which is concentrated in only one degree, degree n. And there is a field in that degree. Okay, so it's a very simple chain complex. So at time s, you know, the, this chain complex evolves. So it's this sphere, this chain complex concentrated in one degree, and it and this chain complex persists until you hit e time e, in which you you know you you put a complex which is which is concentrated in degree in two degrees n and n plus one. And the differential is zero. All other uh, values are uh, dif the differential is identity. or other uh, values are zero. Okay. So here is the here is the way I often draw uh, such a uh, parameterized chain complex. Okay. At time s, I get k. You know, I get one dimensional. At time e, I get two dimension represented by those two lines. And this and this uh, interval. Illustrates that there is, you know, the identity is given by uh, the differential is given by the identity. Okay. So they are cofibrant, you know, they are cofibrant because all the transition functions are inclusions. Okay. So here is a here is this uh, fact, this uh, this um, uh, theorem that says that these complexes that I just defined are the only in the composable cofibrant. Tame parameterized chain complexes. 
So uh, what what uh, what does it mean? You see, all parameterized chain complexes, all chain parameterized chain complexes, is a wide representation type. We will never be able to enumerate. It's in the composable. But in that in this in this uh, setting, if you add cofibrancy assumptions, then actually you can identify in the composable cofibrant uh, chain parameterized chain complexes. And they are given by pairs. They are enumerated by pairs uh, of numbers, S and E. S is between zero and E. It's a real number, a non-negative real number. E is this extended uh, uh, real number. But E has to be bigger or equal than S. Okay? You can enumerate in the composable. Okay? Any, because you can enumerate in the composables, any other cofibrant parameterized chain complex is a direct sum of these uh, of these of these particular uh, chain complexes. So although the the representation type is wild, cofibrant objects in, in for these parameterized chain complexes are more manageable. They are actually you know describable. Okay, they are actually uh, uh, describable. So uh, so our simplifying strategy is to use these more manageable cofibrant object to approximate other more may possibly more complicated objects. Okay? Ob arbitrary objects are complicated. We found uh, we found uh, uh, a collection of more manageable objects. So we are going to use these more manageable objects to approximate more complicated ones. And here minimality is going to play a significant role. Okay. Uh, so uh, so cofibrant object can be used to approximate other objects. So I will uh, try to explain to you what this approximation means. Okay. Wojciech, can so I interrupt a... with a question really quick? Okay, sure. So this question is from uh, Vadim. He chatted in. So he asks, how different is it to study parameterized chain complexes instead of two parameter persistence modules indexed over um, the plane across the natural numbers endowed with the product order? So it is the difference. So this is a subcategory where where composition of very of two vertical maps is zero. Right, you have the chain. Okay, so you can think about this as a two. You can think about parameterized uh, chain complexes as two parameterized vector spaces where where uh, the vertical composition of two very consecutive two vertical maps is zero right that's the chain complex condition all right thanks all right uh, so what is a minimal cover i will explain this meaning of approximation a minimal cover is a morphism you start with some object x and you want to approximate this okay so i will explain this uh, meaning of approximation uh, so i want that approximation this map c to be a vibration and a weak equivalence i don't want to change the homotopy type of my object but I want this to be cofibrant, right? I want to approximate I arbitrary X by a cofibrant guy. And uh, I want this to be minimal in a way. And, and not, not, I want this to be minimal. And I don't know whether you know what the mathematical definition of minimality is. Minimal objects are those that every, they are, it's every endomorphism is an isomorphism. Objects such that they are every endomorphism and isomorphism are called minimal. So, so this I want that approximation to be minimal in this sense. That means that every endomorphism and every map alpha that makes this this uh, this triangle commutative has to be an isomorphism. Okay, that's what I call the minimal cover approximation. And you know, for those people who who uh, have you know any. Uh, who thought a little about homological algebra, one realizes, you know, that that uh, projective resolutions, so approximations, minimal projective resolutions, plays a really significant role for in in, in many things. So the minimal covers is is uh, is this uh, uh, generalization of minimal projective resolutions. Okay. So uh, so so here are one of the properties of those. Uh, you know, minimal covers are unique. So if you have a minimal cover of X and another minimal cover of X, then they are isomorphic, okay? So if a minimal cover exists, it's unique, okay? 
up to an isomorphism. Uh, furthermore, it's they are they are uh, homotopy invariant. If x and y are weakly equivalent, then so are they are uh, minimal covers. Okay. Um, all right. Okay. So uh, uh, let me see. Uh, um, all right. Yeah, okay. Uh, so you know we think about covers as an approximation of X. I'm just trying to so see you remember my notes where I am. Okay. Uh, and these covers determine the homotopy type of objects they approximate. Okay. So in this context, in, it is important to realize uh, that not all model structures admit minimal cover approximation. This is not true that you know any model category actually has such a such approximation. So that's uh, that's uh, uh, so uh, so in this context, it is important to prove that chain parameterized chain complexes actually do admit minimal covers. Right? Moreover, uh, if you look at our paper with Barbara and Claudia, we give a an algorithm. It's sort of like a meta algorithm of constructing such a minimal cover. I know how you know it's. I it's. I know how implementable it is, but it's 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 you know it's algorithmic. Okay. So so yeah. So here's I want to make also a point. So the trouble with connecting model categories and uh, data analysis is that in data analysis we we need things which are computable, which are programmable, which which are implementable. Very often, very often, uh, such covers, for example, by choosing a right model, by if you choose a, a, a right model category uh, for spaces, one of those covers would be n connected cover. Okay, but you see, these these covers are defined uh, by universal properties. So to construct them, homotopies use, you know, infinite steps. They perform in infinite induction, attaching infinite number of of, uh, of uh, uh, elements, going to infinite limits, and then in a limit obtaining this approximation. Such such uh, uh, constructions are useless for topological data analysis. Okay, we need we need these constructions to be made. Uh, implementable so that's one of the that's one of the difficulty on this uh, to make these 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 uh, homotopy construction actually implementable to figure out how we prove existence of these things by constructing them algorithmically and not performing limits okay in limits the behavior uh, can be easily proved but you want to sort of you know you want to do uh, category you know uh, algorithmic constructions that eventually finishes okay so uh you know, every time a parameterized chain complex admits a minimal cover. Okay, so so do you remember uh, our modifying persistence? It converts input into time parameterized chain complexes. Okay, now we can then use this approximation to convert this possibly very complicated object into something that we have more control over, into a cofibrant parameterized chain complex. Okay, using this this uh, minimal cover. Okay. And then I, I know I use our theorem that I can actually classify cofibrant objects. Cofibrant uh, parameterized chain complexes can be identified, can be enumerated by finite subsets, so finite multi subsets of that set. Okay, of that set. So, uh, so let's see how does it compare to the usual standard uh, barcode uh, barcoding analysis. Well, in barcoding analysis, you convert input into persistent modules, which are tame parameterized vector spaces. Okay. So what you can think about these um, uh, about these uh, you can think about the vector space as a chain complex concentrated in, in, in degree zero. Let's say so we can uh, we can embed. We can think of this uh, parameterized vector space as just parameterized chain complex. Concent all these co uh, co uh, chain complexes concentrate in degree zero. So we can, you know, we can we can wonder what is that composition? If I transform persistent vector space, persistent module into 
parameterized chain complex, take a cofibrant uh, approximation, identify it with uh, enumerated uh, with a fine identify with a finite multi subset. What do you get? You actually get the usual barcode. Okay, you get the usual you get the usual barcode. Now I want to uh, point out something. So you see, very often when we uh, talk about persistent diagrams. So you know these these multi subsets of these uh, of these of the half uh, you know this part of the plane, uh, we use diagonal we use diagonal as uh, you know as a sort of a savior in order to for example construct bottleneck distance. We add you know these these points in the diagonal uh, they they are like freebies you know for us they they are free things that we uh, you know we can add or or subtract etc. For chain complexes, they do play an important role. Those are those are you know these these uh, these parameterized parameterized chain complexes, which are disks all the way. Furthermore, the the infinite bars also play play an important role. So the actual uh, this parameterized chain complex give you a framework for discussing information that happens on the diagonal. Okay, on the diagonal. So if you go all the way to homology. You forget that information on the diagonal, but if you stay, it's one step earlier. Actually, the information on the diagonal is is uh, starts playing a role, and that's the information that distinguishes between these two distance spaces I gave you at the beginning. Okay, it's actually it's they are all you know they they h zero h one they are all zero h well okay h h zero mean h one is all zero. Everything happens on the diagonal. If you go to the homology, you don't get anything. But, but the difference you'll see will be on the on the diagonal. So uh, so this is this is the content. Let me just tell you what uh, uh, just summarize a little bit what uh, uh, what I uh, what I said. Uh, so you know we currently are looking for, or I encourage you also to look for modern structures on these parameterized chain complexes. And or maybe parameter and parameterized chain complexes, okay, such that in the composable cofibrant can be enumerated. So maybe you know one one approach is that you choose some objects, you choose some objects that you enumerate already. You ha you have some enumerated object. Can we find a model structure for which these objects are cofibrant? Then you need to you well. There is this balancing act that often you can do actually, but there is this balancing act. You should do it in a way that minimal cover exists. Okay, that you know in itself that you can sort of that's often you can do because you just give you know you specify certain objects, maybe few of them. They can be enumerated. You generate model uh, category for which these objects, or maybe similar to these, are are cofibrant, and uh, you build a model category. Again, this model category often is constructed by fibrations would be certain limits. Cofibrations would be also certain limits. Cofibrant object would, in general would be certain limits of cofibrations. This is not good for for uh, for data analysis. So we need to strike a balance. We want to make sure that minimal cover not only exists, but they can be algorithmically constructed, okay, without passing to too long uh, too long limits. Uh, alternatively, I mean, look, you know, what whatever I said today can be dualized, you know. You might look for for model structures where in the composable fibrin object can be enumerated, and minimal envelopes exist. So you you approximate uh, uh, in another way. Everything that I said today is easily I mean easily not easily but it's dualizable. There are some uh, some uh, things that can be proved have to be proved. But this is it. Okay. Thank you. Any questions? Uh, I have a question, if that's possible. Sure. Um, so y you mentioned it in the last um, slide that you could maybe look at um, sort of multidimensional um, 
same chain complexes. Yeah. Um, would you dare also have the problem that, that you cannot um, uh, enumerate the indecomposable co-fragment objects, for example, for n equal to? Do you already run into this problem? So, so the, uh, which model structure you use? You do you use the standard model structure where uh, vibrations are. Uh, well, uh, I guess you could, you could um, again look at the tame version of what you described, right? So yes, yes. The tame... So no, so so yes, yeah, so uh, so cofibrant objects are no longer uh, in the composables are you know cannot be enumerated. Right. So you have to find ways of uh, of reducing it further, okay? But they cannot be they cannot be enumerated. Okay. But if I okay. can add one one thing, what we show is that um, if if uh, a model category admit the minimal cover, then the model category that Wojciech described of his tame parameterized object admit a minimal cover. So at least we know for sure that also when we go in multi-parameter, there exists a minimal cover. So right. at least there is this uh, invariant that we need, we still need to, to right. study. Right, minimal describe. covers do exist, yes. So but everything goes uh, through. Go in any dimension and still have it. I would you also be able to, to sort of algorithmically find the minimal cover. Uh, do you have hope for that? Uh, well, yes. I'll, I'll, try, I'll try to give an explanation for that next week. Okay. Uh, but yeah, so we can, yes, algorithmically. Is is... Please, Wojtek, sorry. No, so algorithmically we can find minimal cover, absolutely. All right, but we, right. we do not have, I don't think, you know, to, to enumerate it, to, you know, to write, you know, to then write this minimal cover as a, as a sum of indecomposables, that's much harder. Yeah, right. All right. So you will have think so. you will have some you know big you know uh, diagram, okay, you know two parameter chain complex diagrams which is cofibrant, but you do not know how. Uh, I mean, question is how would you retrieve invariants from uh, from uh, from such an object? One way of of doing this is that or maybe it's uh, you know it's split in the composables and I can enumerate this in the composable. But that for two parameter, uh, two parameters, I don't know how to do. I mean, I know I, I know that it's a wide representation type. Uh, so we have Questions. one more question on chat, I'm... namely, what does the diagonal represent? Uh, though, uh, contractible. Uh, so you see, if you look, let, let me go at the at the at the very beginning. Uh, all right, uh, somehow. I have to press. Uh, if you look at this example, uh, the problem is the uh, you look at these spaces. The problem is that the torus ribs of each component is contractible. So what these what these uh, what the diagonal represent, you know, and various spaces can be contractible because it could be it could be a big simplex. Or it could be various disks appearing later on in time. So spaces can be contractible in different ways. So uh, that's what happens in this particular case. And, and the points on the diagonal tells me, you know, in what way the space is contractible. Of course, it doesn't it doesn't classify contractible spaces, but but it gives additional invariant uh, saying that that the component component of these spaces are contractible in a different way than components of that space. Um, and uh, another question in the chat window, uh, does the existence of minimal covers used in the target model category of the functor category is co-fibrantly generated? Uh, no, it doesn't. Uh, it, it doesn't, no. So what's very interesting is that if you start indexing, parameterizing things by line, world, you know, typically if you look, if you want to look at the functors indexed by arbitrary categories or arbitrary posets uh, with values in the model category, that thing is very complicated. 
and you have to use cofibrillin generation, you have to use certain things. But it turns out that all these things is not necessary if you start indexing by, by a line. Okay, it's like, it's funny, it's just, you know. And one of the reason is, one of the reasons is because many constructions can be performed without going to the limits, without taking, uh, without taking, you know, we need cofibrillin generated in order to perform certain big limits. You take the sum of all possible cofibrillin guys that map into it and take a push up. This, this, uh, this, uh, the line allows us to avoid pay, taking this limit. It's very important uh, observation. It, you know, it allows us to perform constructions, very explicit construction. So, so I, I definitely would stay. I personally try to stay away from using arguments like cofibrant generated. However, on the other hand, if we have a zoo of examples of cofibrant uh, 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 objects examples, we might we might sort of restrict to a smaller collection and generate a model category by these cofibrant guys, and see whether we can still construct. Uh, okay. So uh, another question. In, in the chat window. Oh, sorry. Do you want to add anything to that or should I? No, no, uh, no, no, no. Sorry, sorry. Yeah. Um, so the next question is, is this related to Sullivan's minimal model work with Quillen? Yeah, so, yeah, so the, the, the minimal models are, uh, Sullivan's minimal models are examples of minimal, uh, minimal objects, except that they, they remember uh, an algebraic structure. So you know, so they look, you know, you look coaching complex, and coaching complex is not only uh, a complex, but it has a multiplication. It has a cup product, okay? And and the minimal. So if you remember that additional structure, then the minimal Sullivan's minimal model would be a cofibrant cover, but in the category of not chain complexes, but in category of, you know, differential graded algebra. Okay. So, so, but, but it, in, the, in the very same sense, it is much more complicated. You know, whenever you talk, it's very difficult for TDA to encode an algebra. It's just too much information to this algebra information, to cup product information that I don't, uh, but it's in that spirit, it's minimal, yeah. So, uh, so Sullivan models, every self equivalence of minimal model of uh, Sullivan model is an isomorphism. That's the whole point. Okay. Um, do we have any other questions for Wojciech? Um, um, so feel free to ask in the chat window or unmute yourself and ask. You still have to unmute yourself. Um, so if not, I'm going to ask you to unmute yourself regardless so that we thank Wojciech for his wonderful talk. And um, uh, next time we meet is next week, and it's going to be a continuation of this talk uh, by Barbara, like with more examples of how to use model category um, in TDA. Uh, so I wish you all a nice week, and I'll see you next week. Bye-bye. Thank you for your Bye. attention. Thank you. Yeah, thanks.